Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate, day number 518, 518. August the 12th, 2018, Sunday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, today uh, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of yesterday. Uh, of course, yesterday I spent most of the time talking about uh, Julian Assange and uh, as far as uh, my believing that he is likely, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure, and it's quite likely that he may be the person who has been described as our guy by Christopher Steele in these messages to Bruce Orr, which we covered yesterday. So Bruce Orr sends out these text messages and, um, or, I mean, Steele is text messaging Bruce Orr. And on a couple of different occasions, he says he's talking about our guy. And so there's a big mystery about who our guy is. So we're all trying to figure out who our guy is. And the leading candidates are obviously Assange, a lot of people think it could be Oleg Deripaska. Some people think it's Renat Akhmichin. Uh, some people think it could be Halper. Some people think Papagalopoulos. Or it could be someone that, whose name we've never even heard at this point. So we really don't know. It's all speculation. I do believe we're going to get the answer to that question and probably sooner than later. But in the meantime, it's okay to speculate and have some fun trying to guess and figure out who it may be. So yesterday I gave... Uh, uh, went through this stuff and I just gave my reasons for why I believe it's likely is Julian Assange. Could be someone else, but at this point, from the characters that we know about, I think Assange is the most likely. But there could be someone whose name we don't know about or we haven't thought about. So today I want to I want to go to uh, Deripaska because I noticed a lot of people in the comments section believe it could be Deripaska. Uh, I've heard other people talk about it being Deripaska. So I thought we'd take a closer look at Deripaska. Uh, his name certainly has come up a lot in the last, uh, it was coming up a lot back, uh, you know, eight, nine months ago when we first, you know, learned that he was involved uh, with um, uh, uh, Mr. Waldman. Uh, Mr. Waldman represents Deripaska. Of course, he, he uh, was represented by Manafort. Uh, he's connected, got connections to other people. Uh, so he's connected to a lot of people because of who he is and his status in, in, in the world. He's one of the richest men in the world. At one time, he was the ninth richest man in the world. So he's a very interesting character, and we're going to dig into him a little bit today and see what we can learn. And um, <clears throat> there's so much to learn about Deripaska. You could spend hours and hours just reading about this guy. So he's got a he's got quite a um, he's got quite a bio, I guess you would say. But I want to focus on the things that will be pertinent to what we're talking about now. Uh, but before I jump into that, just want to make one note before I get into that, which is that <clears throat> when we look now back over the past couple of weeks in these special elections, there were on the uh, Republican side nine special elections, and of the special elections, um, I guess you could say Trump won eight out of nine. Trump-backed candidates won eight out of nine. On the other hand, we had Ocasio-Cortez, who had nine candidates also that she had campaigned for or supported or promoted, and only one of nine of the people she promoted got uh, one. So anyway, uh, Trump's eight for nine, Ocasio-Cortez one for nine. It's a pretty good track record for the Trumpster, not so good for Ocasio-Cortez. But it also uh, is just another uh, nail in the coffin of the so-called blue wave. Um, I can't imagine that the Republicans would do that well, and Trump would get eight out of nine in these special elections. And even though the race in Ohio was close in the 12th district, it does appear, I know there's still outstanding ballots to come in, but it does appear that's going to, uh, going to be a Republican seat. So, um, all in all, um, if we were going to see a blue wave, we had the special elections out in California. There were some districts that the Democrats thought they could pick up. They did not. They thought they were going to have a pretty big day this past week with the special elections. They did not. So, um, it, it just, it's just more evidence that, that the big blue wave isn't coming. And uh, at this point, the only question is, is there going to be a red wave? Because <laughs> it very well could happen if you continue, if things continue on the current trend. So we'll continue to watch that. And of course, once we get after Labor Day, then of course we'll be talking a lot about the upcoming elections as all these other things are unfolding. So it's going to be a really, really busy uh, after Labor Day. Things are really going to heat up on the election front and also on the story that we cover primarily here with Towergate. So let's go ahead and dig into um, Oleg Deripaska. So I'm going to start just with a brief bio for those of you who aren't really familiar with just in general about him. Uh, of course, he is a Russian aluminum oligarch. He's a billionaire. He was once, once the ninth richest man in the world. At one time, his estimated wealth was 28 
billion dollars. Now, he had some issues, and then um, they had some bad things happen in the economy in Russia. There was a real downturn. He had a couple problems with a couple businesses. He's had some failed business things happen, and at one point his uh, net worth dropped to $5.6 billion. But it's been back on the climb, and he's uh, back into... Uh, uh, he's still rich. $5.6 billion is still a lot of money, right? <laughs> but anyway, so he's kind of back into an upward mobility now and uh, getting back to where he once was. <clears throat> he's your typical billionaire. He's kind of an, an eccentric, and uh, he is an internationalist. He's got connections to... Uh, of course, the Rothschilds, uh, uh, the Rockefellers, you know, the whole nine yards, all the big-time Russian oligarchs, the European oligarchs. He's a, he's a billionaire oligarch, an international oligarch, oligarch, and his company is the second largest aluminum company in the world. It is called United Company Royale. He's also uh, one of the largest philanthropists in the world. He donates a lot of money, and he has the largest charitable organization in Moscow, which he primarily focuses on education seems to be uh, where he puts most of his time and energy on the philanthropy front. Uh, he graduated from the University of Moscow with a degree in physics. In other words, he's not an idiot. Uh, he's, he, was, um, he does have very close ties to Putin. They've had a rocky relationship over the years. There have been times when they've been pretty tight, and there's been times when they have had fallen out uh, periods. So <clears throat> where... Putin has publicly admonished him. So they've had a kind of a, a different relationship. It's been kind of up and down. But uh, generally, they're perceived to be um, um, friends and uh, know each other very well. Of course, we know that uh, he employed Paul Manafort uh, as a political consultant from 2005 and 2009. And, of course, they had a joint business venture uh, that kind of went belly up, and that created uh, some legal issues between them, and that's been well publicized. Um, <clears throat> he is married to Boris Yeltsin's step-granddaughter. Boris Yeltsin's step-granddaughter. So he probably likes vodka, runs in the family. <laughs> I don't know if I ever saw Yeltsin sober. <laughs> um, he was granted citizenship in Cyprus by 20, in 2017. So obviously he's a citizen of Cyprus. I imagine it's dual citizenship because I assume he's still a Russian citizen. But uh, he certainly is now a citizen of Cyprus. <clears throat> of course, he's also been accused of having links to Russian organized crime. And that's always been around. But quite honestly, it's nearly impossible to be a major player in business in Russia without somehow running across um, the bad element in Russia, the criminal element, because it's so widespread. And so, you know, there's so much of it. I mean... So I don't really hold that against him. I think he's uh, he's a businessman, and you can't do business in Russia and not run into some organized crime uh, stuff. It's just impossible. And that's probably true in Europe and uh, the States and everywhere else as well. So I don't know how much uh, stock I put into that, but it's there, and it's the reason that he's been sanctioned over, over a period of years. And um, it's why he is currently under sanction. Uh, they put him under sanction on in April of 2018, again, for his ties, alleged ties, to um, Russian organized crime. Now, uh, he did offer to testify in front of Congress um, back about six months ago. Uh, he wrote, uh, which he's also done, written quite a few um, opinion pieces, which have been published in American papers like the Wall Street Journal and other things, because he speaks, you know, very good English. Um, and so... Uh, he, he, he wrote uh, a couple of stories. One was uh, criticizing Fusion GPS, but another one was an article he wrote where he talked about that he offered to testify in front of Congress about you know anything they want to ask, but he did want to be granted immunity from prosecution. Uh, and I don't know, that's probably just uh, to avoid falling into a legal trap or something like that. Um, I don't think it was necessarily an admission of being guilty because a lot of people think uh, he's uh, was a source for the dossier and uh, that he may have been involved in all this kind of stuff. And at this point, I think the jury is out on that. But uh, he had offered to testify, and um, apparently those folks over there in the Senate Intelligence Committee did not want him testifying. So I think he kind of, like most billionaires, he plays his cards. He's a self-interested man. Uh, like most people who are billionaires, they're interested in, in themselves and in their own interests. That's what they're pursuing. 
And uh, it seems like his relationship with the U.S. government has been that when they have something that's of mutual interest to them, they work together. Uh, they'll be nice to him. But when there's some issue where they're opposed, then they're not so nice. So it's, again, it's kind of a, a strange relationship that he has with the U.S. government. Sometimes they love him, sometimes they hate him sort of thing. Depends on what he can do for them or what they what he can do for the government or what the government can do for him. So he's self-interested just as our government is self-interested. And when, when their interests align, uh, they're good with each other. And when they're not in line, they are not good with each other. And that's uh, fairly typical of these types of individuals. So let's dig in a little bit deeper now uh, away from the general and get into the more specific. And I'm going to go through some recent things that we know um, and then some things that we learned about him months ago and then see if whether or not we can determine he might be a candidate for being the other guy. <clears throat> so the first facts I'm going to give you come from Chuck Ross of the Daily Caller, and this is a recent article uh, where uh, Chuck Ross says that uh, Steele, Christopher Steele, was working on the Trump dossier at the same time that he was lobbying uh, DOJ official Bruce Orr on behalf of Russian oligarch linked to Putin. And of course, we're talking about Deripaska. So as we can see from these uh, emails from Steele to Orr, Steele appears to be, in fact he is, lobbying on, ha on behalf of Deripaska. He's asking Bruce Orr, hey, you know, you know, our good friend Deripaska, you know, he's, he's trying to get uh, granted citizenship to the U.S. He's got some problems. Uh, I understand his lawyer is telling me, Mr. Waldman, that they're making progress and things may be looking up and that he could probably benefit you, uh, and Christopher Steele is asking Bruce Orr to keep an eye on that as it progresses and to let him know how things are looking for Mr. Deripaska. So clearly Steele, Christopher Steele, had some interest in helping promote the interest of Deripaska to try to get him uh, a visa to enter the country. And so that's worth keeping in the back of your mind. Uh, keep in mind we we know for, for a fact that Mr. Waldman was representing uh, Deripaska and Christopher Steele and Julian Assange. So how that little cabal all comes together, uh, I really don't know. It's not totally clear yet, but I'm sure it'll get clearer uh, as the days and weeks uh, move on. Steele thought that the U.S. government should grant visas to Deripaska, and of course he had been barred from the U.S., and that's what I just talked about. Of course, uh, Deripaska had hired Adam Waldman in 2009 to lobby the U.S. government to obtain a visa for the billionaire. So that's, that's his relationship with, with Waldman, and I don't know if it's re his relationship with Waldman that got him connected to Steele or Assange, or if there's any connection to Assange at all, or it's just coincidence that Waldman is involved with Deripaska as a lawyer and he's representing the other guys. I don't know if this is, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's some, you know, connection for nefarious reasons or if it's just that Mr. Waldman is a, a good attorney and is connected in Washington and is a guy whose name is out there as someone who you'd want to call if you're looking for someone who can help you with your problems with the U.S. government. And I think that that's probably more likely the scenario here. <clears throat> I don't see anything really, you know, scary going on here, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't see the conspiratorial, conspiratorial uh, angle yet with uh, Deripaska being associated with uh, Mr. Waldman, who's associated with Assange and Steele. Now, the dossier relies heavily on information from an anonymous Kremlin insider. Uh, who claims that the Russian government was colluding with the Trump campaign to defeat the rotten Reverend Clinton. So it is this that makes a lot of people think Deripaska may be that guy or our guy because he is obviously knows a lot of people in the Russian government, uh, certainly um, people inside the Kremlin and that type of thing. So and he does know Waldman, he does know Steele, so it's very possible, uh, you know, it's possible, but Again, I just when I look at Deripaska, he just seems to me to be too smart to get involved in, in something like that, and uh, he seems to take the more traditional legal approach to dealing with his problems. He hires lobbyists, lawyers, people who are connected, people who can make things happen for him. Um, 
there's always the possibility that the FBI could have dangled in front of him or Steele could have dangled in front of him or someone could have dangled in front of him. Hey, Mr. Deripaski, you want that visa? Give us some dirt on Trump or people around Trump and maybe we can help you out with that. I, I can see the FBI making that overture to him or Steele or someone else, but I just see Deripaska, if you look at his track record, I just think he's too smart to get involved in any of that and he doesn't need to. Uh, he can he can he can go directly, you know. He doesn't have to get involved in all that. He's got a, a pretty direct shot because of his status, his wealth, the people he knows. He's connected to the highest level people uh, all over the world. It just I just don't know why he would mess around with any of that, and that's why I have my doubts about uh, Deripaska being uh, that guy. Steele claimed that Deripaska had been encouraged by the agency guys who told uh, Adam Waldman that the U.S. government's stance on Deripaska is softening. Uh, yes, that was in the emails where uh, Christopher Steele was telling Bruce Orr, hey, can you keep an eye on the situation with Deripaska? Because it looks like, from what we're hearing uh, from Mr. Waldman, that the government's position is softening. In other words, the money that Deripaska was paying Waldman to try to fix his problem uh, with not being able to be granted access to the country, that Mr. Waldman was, you know, earning his money. He was getting it done. And uh, Steele wanted uh, Bruce Orr to keep an eye on that. Now, on February 21st of 2016, a key time period in the timeline, Steele emailed Bruce Orr, and he said he was circulating reporting that he had done on Deripaska that suggested that, olig that the oligarch was not a tool of the Kremlin. So here again, uh, that is another email where essentially you have Christopher Steele telling Bruce Orr, yeah, well, I've been uh, doing some writing of some articles, and I've been spreading that around, probably through Confusion GPS and others, that I've been spreading, writing these stories and spreading them around that Deripaska is not uh, a tool of Putin uh, or of the Kremlin. So again, this is just Christopher Steele trying to help Deripaska. Now, why was Steele going out of his way to help Deripaska? That does raise a very good question. Did, did Steele tell Deripaska, hey, you know, if you give me some information for my dossier, uh, I can help you, you know, but I would think that, uh, that Deripaska would, you know, he doesn't really need Christopher Steele. I mean, Christopher Steele is like low level compared to Deripaska. Deripaska's got a direct line to Washington, D.C. He's got Mr. Waldman working for him, unless maybe Mr. Waldman uh, called Christopher Steele and said, yeah, you know, I'm working for Deripaska. You know, I'm working on his case, but it would sure help a lot uh, if, I could, if I could give them something. You know, if I could give Mark Warner or Mr. Burr or some of the anti-Trump Republicans, M McCain or, or someone like that, if I, if I could give them something uh, that could come from Deripaska, that would certainly help. So we don't know. Uh, this is all, again, just speculation. We just don't have enough information. But again, I, I, I just, it seems like it would be out of character for Deripaska to get mixed up with these people. Now, um, also, as a part of that email where Christopher Steele is telling Bruce Orr um, that he was putting out stories uh, that were saying that Deripaska was not a tool of the Kremlin, he also said that we reckon, therefore, that the forthcoming contact with Deripaska represents a good opportunity for the U.S. government. So he was talking about uh, that if the U.S. government uh, grants Deripaska the visas that it would be in their best interest because uh, um, uh, Deripaska could present a good opportunity for them. So, almost like buttering, it's almost like Steele is trying to butter up uh, or so that he can butter up the FBI or whoever else to say, hey, we need to really, you know, try to push to get Deripaska taken care of because he could be of some benefit to us. What benefit? I don't know. Again, that's just not clear. Of course, we know that Deripaska sued Paul Manafort over a false, uh, over a failed business deal, including uh, this Ukrainian cable company that was a business they got involved in that failed. And then, of course, there was issues in dissolving that business and in the process of dissolving that business, Deripaska felt that Manafort pocketed some cash, which he may have. I don't know. 
but um, if there was an angle here, it might have been this angle here, as opposed to the dossier or intelligence, uh, the PP Gate story, uh, Melion, any of this other stuff. Deripaska to me just seems like the type of guy who wouldn't have gotten involved in that. But if 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 what they wanted was him from him was something negative about Paul Manafort, who was Trump's campaign manager, uh, he might have, you know, again, he might have said, okay, well, yeah, I've got issues with Paul Manafort or whatever. I'll be more happy to tell you what I know about Manafort. And maybe that would have been something that the FBI would have been interested in getting information on. So that's kind of how I see it. I think Deripaska was not so much someone who was willing to go in there and say, make up crazy stories, dossier stories, you know, or anything like that, like we saw in the dossier, the PP Gate story, or anything like that. I just don't, that's just not Deripaska's style to me. But, I mean, I think he uh, would have said, yeah, I mean, if you want to ask me questions about Manafort or whatever, or, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be more happy to, to talk to you about that. But, you know, I don't think they would have got him to stick his neck out and do something stupid, getting involved in this uh, crazy thing like the dossier. He, he would have, he's too smart. He would have known the risk and all that. And what would have been the reward, the, the travel visa? He, he was getting that anyway. I mean, he was, he was working on that on another front. He had other things he could do. He's just... He's a guy who has too many. He has too many ways of accomplishing what he wants to, to to get entry back into the U.S. without having to roll around in the mud and be part of something as crazy as the dossier. And I just think he's too smart to have done it. Of course, we know that the FBI did actually ask Deripaska about the about Trump Russia collusion. This actually occurred in September on September 8th, actually, of 2016. And as, we're, as we understand how, how that went down, is that the FBI uh, uh, comes to his, um, I guess, hotel, and one of the FBI agents, of which there were three, had worked with him on another issue when they were trying to get a, an American spy out of Iran. And uh, so he knew Deripaska from that. But apparently what happened here is that these FBI agents said something to him about, hey, what do you think about Trump colluding with Russia? And apparently he laughed out loud, thought it was a joke, thought they were kidding, literally thought they were joking. But when he realized that they weren't joking, he said to them, quote, you're trying to create something out of nothing. And, and that he said that his informed opinion, informed opinion, is that the proposition of a Trump-Russia plot is false. He's saying that his informed opinion is that the proposition of a Trump-Russian plot is false. So this would tell you right here that he's telling the FBI, hey, you guys are crazy. A Trump-Russia plot to fix the election? Uh, that's a joke, man. You can't be serious about that. Come on now. So that's how he took it when, they, when the FBI questioned him on that back in September of 2016. Now, the FBI visited Deripaska again sometime in 2017. We don't know what transpired there. But we do know that in 2009, when Mueller was the FBI director, the FBI asked Deripaska to spend millions of his own dollars funding an FBI-supervised operation to rescue a retired FBI agent who had been captured in, I in Iran while working for the CIA back in 2007. The operation was ready to go, but, uh, and of course he was able to do this because he owned a, business, a couple of these steel uh, aluminum businesses and other businesses in Iran. And so he had free travel into Iran. And uh, I guess they had this operation put together. Uh, they believed they had a high success rate that they could pull it off. And at the last minute, the rotten Reverend Clinton, head of the State Department, had to give final approval, and the rotten Reverend Clinton shot it down. Now, since 2011, Deripaska has been granted entry at least eight times on a diplomatic visa, even though he is not a diplomat. We know that in May of 2018, Alan Waldman contacted John Solomon, out of the blue, at thehill.com, to tell him about the FBI visiting Deripaska and asking him about Trump-Russia collusion. And the speculation is, is that Deripaska was getting a little frustrated. He had not gotten his visa yet, and, uh, or it was going to be rejected, or whatever. He heard about these things, and maybe he thought he could use a little bit of leverage. And so he uh, had this story. He, uh, he had his lawyer, Waldman, contact Solomon and give 
the hill this story. And it was probably just a way of, of Deripaska giving a little nudge to the government to say, hey, I know some things. I know some things, and I'd really like to have that visa, and I can be really quiet. You know, if I could get my visa, I could be really quiet. But if I don't get my visa, I could make a little noise. So, um, and he knows that the last thing that a lot of people want to hear about in Washington, D.C. is anyone who could question the Trump-Russia collusion narrative. And, of course, we know from what Deripaska told the FBI that he obviously doesn't believe in the Trump-Russia uh, collusion narrative. And so maybe he was trying to use that as uh, a little leverage. But the problem he had uh, is that this was May of 2018. And Obama wasn't the president anymore. You know, it was a different administration, the Trump administration, and they were looking at uh, his connections uh, to all these people during the 2016 election that were part of the dossier, Steele and all these people. And uh, I guess his feel to uh, the fact that he's connected to some Russian gangs or whatever, uh, they decided to not to go ahead with his visa. So this would have been a threat, but it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been th threatening to Trump uh, unless he was going to say something about maybe he had information that would prove that there was some Trump-Russia collusion, but he'd already gone on record with the FBI uh, as having said it was crazy. So not really sure what message he was trying to send or who he was trying to send a message to. But it's just kind of strange that he would have his lawyer call John Solomon or someone at the Hill. I'm not sure it was Solomon. Uh, yeah, it was John Solomon, actually. It was John Solomon. Um, to say, hey, you know, my client, Mr. Deripaska, um, you know, he's got some information about the Trump-Russia thing. <laughs> you know, and he's trying to get that visa done, you know, and it looks like that they're trying to uh, block him from entering the country, and uh, they might put him back on the list, and he might be under sanction because they were discussing putting him under sanction, which he is now under sanctions. And so that, that probably works in Trump's favor because why would Trump have his people put sanctions on uh, Deripaska, prevent him from entering the, co the country if he's got damaging information on Trump. He wouldn't, unless it's the deep state saying, hey, let's hammer Deripaska. Let's deny him a visa. Let's put sanctions on him and see if he turns and see if he gives us some bad info on Trump. It's hard to know when you're dealing at this level of these types of smoke and mirrors, crazy games with the intelligence community and all the things that are going on. There's just so many questions. It just isn't clear right now uh, what to make of Deripaska. So here's a question or a couple questions. Why did Mark Warner prevent Oleg Deripaska from testifying to Congress? He volunteered to do so. So uh, again, who was he trying to hurt there? Again, uh, Deripaska is a man looking out for his own interest. And if he can use a little leverage he'll use it. And we can see here's two examples of Deripaska using leverage. One, he has his lawyer uh, write a story or, or give call John Solomon at the Hill and give him information that could be used in a story that might raise the suspicion that he's got some information. And then, of course, he's telling the Congress, yeah, I'd like to testify in front of Congress. Uh, you know, I certainly would, you know, knowing good and well that he probably has a lot of information. And they, of course, know in the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, that his previous position had been that the idea of Trump-Russia collusion was crazy. So they didn't want Mr. Deripaska to come in during questioning and debunk the Trump-Russia narrative. So it appears that Deripaska doesn't matter which side of the equation he's on. He doesn't seem to have a particular favorability toward the left, toward the right, a Democrat, Republican, Trump, Hillary. He doesn't seem to care. He just seems to be looking after his own interests. Whoever's there is the guy he's got to deal with. And if he's got something he can, he can use as a little leverage, he'll use it. I mean, there's nothing unusual about this. Did Deripaska give Christopher Steele information in exchange for a visa to enter the U.S.? This is a question that a lot of people are asking. And again, my position is that he probably did not because I just think he doesn't need to. He's got other ways that he can do things. This would have been a, like a last ditch or something. And, and uh, you know, if you look at the time frame when the dossier is being put together, um, he was being granted. He was in the process of being granted entry into the country. He didn't really need to do that. And why would he be dealing with steel? 
He's got Mr. Waldman. He can deal directly with a lot of high-powered people. Why would he use a hack like Christopher Steele? I just, I'm just not buying into that one. Not yet. Maybe some more information will come forward and I'll be on board. But right now, I put the question mark on that. Glenn Simpson said that Christopher Steele told him that Steele's information was not coming from Russia, but was coming from a former Russian intelligence officer who lives in the U.S. Well, this is what a lot of people are saying, but this would not bring in Deripaska. He's not a former intelligence officer. He probably knows some intelligence people, <clears throat> and he obviously knows Putin. But this would actually point more toward Mr. Akhmichin, because Mr. Akhmichin was, in fact, a former military intelligence officer who was also at the Trump Tower meeting, who was also at the Halifax Conference International Conference, where John McCain talked to um, uh, Sir what's his name uh, about the dossier. So I don't really see um, this conversation bringing Deripaska into play. I think it looks more like Akhmichin would be the man in play with that particular uh, issue there with Glenn Simpson uh, telling um, with Glenn Simpson saying that Steele told him that the information he was getting was coming from Russia. Glenn Simpson also told the committee that that Steele had never gone directly to Russia, that he hadn't been there in 17 years, that he was relying on people within Russia, and we know one of them was Mr. Baumgartner, who had a lot of sources in Russia, <clears throat> probably Nellie Orr getting a lot of it through open source. <clears throat> but Mr. Deripaska would not have been <clears throat> his intelligence source or someone connected to intelligence. And again, I just... Deripaska, to me, just does not sound like the type of guy who would get involved in this kind of shady stuff with the dossier and all that. I think he would, would you know, walk away from it. He obviously didn't believe the Trump-Russia collusion story. So I think this stuff is way below him. This is, you know, he's, he's way up there. And, and he's up in the thin air, in the uh, very thin air. Uh, he's not down there in the, in, you know, with uh, rolling around in the mud with people like Christopher Steele and Halp Halper and all these guys. He's, he's way above these people. So I just don't see Deripaska uh, being involved in that way unless they really hit him with an ultimatum and said, hey, you know, we really will grant you everything, give you everything you want. Just give us some dirt. Uh, maybe, maybe, but I, I would, I would, I say less than 50-50, probably much less than 50-50. I think Mr. Akhmichin may be a better candidate than Deripaska, and he's got a lot of issues too because he don't, doesn't meet some of the other criteria because we have some criteria. And when I look at the criteria, Assange meets all the criteria with the exception of the one sentence where about, oh, we don't want to force this guy to go home. If you take out that, Assange fits perfectly. But Deripaska and Akhmichin, there are too many things with the criteria that doesn't work for them. So I think Papagalopoulos may be a better number two. I think maybe Papagalopoulos will be a better number two. So I would have to say Assange, Papagalopoulos uh, as being uh, our guy. I'd have to say Assange, I, I think most likely, if not him, then maybe Papagalopoulos. If not, probably someone we haven't heard of. 